Amen. All right, praise the Lord. So, we're going to look tonight, Scripture uh, in Mark chapter 9, verses 14 through 29. I titled this, The Power of Faith. And uh, we're going to see what we can learn from this passage of Scripture and see what we can apply to our lives as well. So the Bible says, when he came to the disciples, we're talking about Jesus, he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. And immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed. And running to him, they greeted him. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? Then one of the crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought you my son and who has a mute spirit. And when, wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth gnashes his teeth and, become rigid, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. He answered and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought him to him, and when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And, Jesus, and he said, From childhood... And, uh, all, and often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But, it, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, Come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him, and he became as one dead, so that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast him out? And so he said to them, This kind can come out by nothing but by prayer and fasting. So, a little bit of background what's going on here. In the New Testament times, uh, just like we have today, we may not see it as much because we call them sometimes by other names, but they had demon possession back then. Uh, people were demonized, and in the New Testament time, demon possession was considered to be the most impossible malady to cure. People, including religious leaders, were so powerless in the presence of demons that demon-possessed individuals were often chained up and left in remote conditions. A famous example of this in Scripture is the demoniac who was kept in the remote region of Gadara. Mark 5, 1 through 5 says, They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes, and when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles, shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, and neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself in stone. So we see that they, they didn't know what to do in this particular situation, but this wasn't the only situation. Um, people had a struggle with people that, that were out of control, that were demon-possessed, and they didn't know how to help them, and they would put them in isolated places. However, in our text, we have a boy that is being tormented, and it's obviously, uh, we see from the text, he's been tormented by a demon. And when his father brought it uh, his, to Jesus, um, he didn't see, Jesus didn't see, uh, well, I should say the father didn't see his son's condition as an impossible situation at all, because he believed Jesus had power over those demons. So let me say that again. Even though the father was struggling, he didn't see the situation as impossible when Jesus came on the scene. Because when Jesus came on the scene, he believed Jesus had power over demons because why else would he bring his child to the disciples? I actually think they brought him to Jesus, but Jesus was up on the mountain with three of the other disciples. And so uh, the disciples that were down there, they've had success in the past. And so while they had success in the past, uh, he decided that they were going to try and do something. Of course, they were not able to do that. When Jesus came down off the mountain, uh, Jesus asked what's going on. And he gets into a conversation with the man, what's been happening to him. And Jesus said to him in Mark 9, 23, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. So really, that's what I want to focus on, not so much the demon possession, but I want to focus on this. If you can believe, 
all things are possible to him who believes. Now notice, it doesn't say some things are possible. It doesn't say most things are possible. It says all things are possible. What's the qualification to one who believes? Now, I'm not going to do a lot of uh, preaching per se and go off and, and try to bring this and make it relevant to you, but if I was going to do that, if I was going to do that, what are some impossible situations that people face? Dementia, Alzheimer's, cancer, uh, autism. What are lots of things today that people say, there's no hope for that. I want you to know the Bible says all things are possible. And the context of that is they came to Jesus and said, if you can. A lot of times what we learn how to do is we learn how to cope with our situation. And I'm not saying there's not a place for that. But when Jesus comes on the scene, like this man, like the woman that had an issue of blood, it creates something within us, faith or a spark is birthed within us, where even though we were left without hope before, like the demon-possessed man that was chained and held in the tombs when Jesus showed up, he, he instinctively knew, this man can help me. This person, uh, the, the father of the boy, something within him said, Jesus can help me. Nobody else could help me, but Jesus could help me. The woman with the issue of blood, and I'm hoping that you know the context of that, had spent everything she had on trying to get people to help her, and no one was able to help her. When she heard about Jesus, something inside her said, He can help me. Because in this text the father believed, Jesus indeed cast the demons out of his son, and he returned the boy to his father as a normal child. In Mark 9, 25 through 27, uh, when Jesus saw the people came running together, again, we're looking at this, the, that, that incident, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him, enter him no more. The spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, came out of him, and he became as one dead, so that many said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, and he arose. That day, Jesus taught this principle. If one can simply believe, anything is possible. Even setting somebody free that's possessed by demonic spirits, wherever faith is present, the impossible is doable. So however your uh, uh, terminology, whatever you want to use, I know we're talking to the church, uh, whether you be demon-possessed or you're tormented or you're being afflicted, whatever the case may be, I want you to know that Jesus Christ, if you believe, everything is possible. Doesn't matter what you're going through, doesn't matter what your situation is, Jesus can set you free. Are you sure? Well, I, I, how's, how do I know if he's going to do that in my life? If you believe, all things are possible. So that brings us to our first point, and that we're going to focus on that word possible. The word possible is from the Greek word dunata and expresses the idea of ability, power, one who is able, capable, one who is competent. The word dunata shares the same root word with the word dunamis, which is another Greek word for power. Often in classical Greek and in the Old Testament, uh, Testament Septuagint, the word dunamis was used to depict the assembled forces of an army whose combined strength enabled them to achieve unrivaled victories. These troops were so strong that they simply could not be resisted. But in addition, we find in classical Greek and also in the Septuagint that the word dunamis can also describe the power that is inherent in a certain aspect of nature. For example, the power in a hurricane would be described as dunamis power. Anybody ever, hear, ever been through a hurricane? Right, uh, Marty's from New York, but I think he was baptized in, uh, in uh, Texas weather uh, when he came down here. I don't know that they have very many. They have some recently, but the, uh, in, the, in the past, how many have had hurricanes up in New York? But I seen from the time I was little, I, we had hurricanes. In fact, I remember, you know, we had single pane glass in our house, and the reason I know, I didn't know that as a kid. Uh, I don't think you had any other options, but I know that now. And I remember uh, we had masking tape, and we would mask the glass, you know, with the masking tape, and then we would go outside and play. 
and then the hurricane would come, and then there was an eye. I remember this. There was like, I didn't know it was an eye, but all of a sudden it was calm again. We went, we went outside and played. Basically, we were playing right in the middle of a hurricane. That was when the eye came over, right? But I want you to know that even this little storm that we had, I think it was last year, I didn't know it, it turned into a hurricane. It was just supposed to be a storm. I didn't make any preparations. I didn't do anything. But I went out uh, after, the, after that next day. Somebody said, well, it turned into a, uh, you know, a number one hurricane. And uh, so anyway, I went out after that, the day after that, and there were trees uprooted everywhere. I mean, just pulled up by the roots, laying on the side. Now, it's possible that there was a tornado that's, that came through that, but it also could have been the winds. But I want you to know, that's a number one. And then there's two, three, four, and five. There is a lot of power in a hurricane, right? Now, anybody ever see the tornadoes? Now, we're not, uh, uh, they didn't talk about tornadoes in the text, but anybody ever seen those tornadoes that they, they show these tornado chasers and the, what the power of a tornado? I think there was a video a couple of weeks ago for a, a boy went through the middle and got caught up in a tor tornado in a pickup and it flipped him on its side. And when he came out the other side, it flipped back over and he was able to drive home, right? The power, I mean, you know, we're working on a truck out there, and I want you to know, me and two other guys, if we try it all day long, we're not going to be able to flip over that truck. And he just got curled on the outskirts of that. But imagine the power in nature. The power in a hurricane would be described as dunamis power because it's a, mighty, it's a power so mighty that it's impossible to resist or impossible to defeat. Paul says in the book of Romans, and the word he uses for power is this same Greek word. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God to the salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Now, uh, I'm not going to preach on this today, but that word salvation means spirit, soul, body, every dimension of your life. That word salvation actually means for wholeness in every dimension of your life. The power of God, and, it, and it's not saying, because I, I used to read it this way, I, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's powerful. I used to read it like that, but that's not what it says. It says it is the power of God for what? For the salvation, spirit, soul, body, for the wholeness of everyone, and here's the qualification, who believes? For the Jew first. And also for the Greek. Romans 15, 18 through 19, Paul goes on. He says, I will dare not to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all around Elycrium I have fully preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. First Corinthians, same Greek word uh, for power. First Corinthians 4 and 20. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. Our text that we were reading emphatically tells us that there is a power that causes one to become able, capable, or competent for any task. When this explosive power comes on the scene and begins to operate in the person's life, it doesn't matter how unfit or unqualified he was before, this power supernaturally empowers him, energizes him, and makes him capable for the task that was set before him. I'm reminded in, in, in the, uh, I think it's in the book of Ezekiel. Uh, the Bible says that, that God said, Ezekiel, stand up. And Ezekiel couldn't stand up. But when the Lord said, stand up, the Spirit of God actually went and stood him up and allowed him. And the same thing happened with Daniel and put them in a position that they were not able to be in on their own. The Spirit of God actually empowered them to stand in the presence of God. And I want you to know that anything that we do in Christ, I'm talking about, uh, and I will relate uh, uh, what we're talking about here to the power of signs and wonders and miracles because I believe God wants to do signs and wonders and miracles. But I'm talking about for anything in life, if God has called you to do something, he, you're not going to do it in your own abilities. You're not going to do it in your own strength. You're not going to do it on your own. You can try, but the Bible says it's not by might, not by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord, whom God calls, he equips. Whom God calls, he qualifies. If God calls you to do something, then like 100% of the people that have ever gone before you, the people that he calls, do not have the ability to do what he's asked them to do. And oftentimes we determine whether we're going to do what God wants us to do based on whether we think we can do it. And I'm telling you from the very beginning, you can't. That's why he's calling you. 
God didn't choose the, 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 the wise things of the world. He chose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. What I'm doing here tonight, what I do here full time, what I've been doing here as a pastor for the last 18 years in this church, but I did for eight or nine years before that in other churches, what I'm doing, I do not have the ability to do. How do you do it then? Because the power of the Spirit of God comes on my life and I'm anointed and empowered by God to do what I do. I try to put some things together without the power of the Spirit of God and when I try to do that, I get afraid, I get scared, I don't know what I'm going to say, I can't put two words together. In fact, I was asked to uh, pray at a funeral uh, a couple of, couple of months ago and uh, I wasn't doing the funeral, it was for Anna's uh, aunt, but they wanted me to be a part of it, and so they just asked me to say a prayer. And you know, I preach to you guys twice a week at least, I stand before people all the time, uh, but when I do that, the Spirit of God is on my life. And, and when I went to, do, to, to say this little prayer, I don't know why, but I was very conscious of the fact that at that particular moment, I didn't have the same empowerment that I have when I'm preaching. And all, and all I could think to myself is, I hope I don't mess up. Uh, what did I say? Uh, did I say anything wrong? I sat down. I was so riddled with fear and confusion and be, because of what? Because I was doing it in my own strength. And I want you to know, I was very made, made very much aware that this is Rick's baseline. This is where Rick normally is. This is what Rick can do. What you see happening when I preach, uh, uh, and sometimes it's, I'm a little more empowered than in other times, but what you see happening when I preach, this isn't Rick. This is Rick, but this is Rick empowered by the Holy Spirit. And I said, why are you telling me that? It doesn't mean that everything I do is right. It doesn't mean you have to accept everything that I do. I'm not saying that at all. All I'm saying is that God empowers me to do what I do. So why are you telling us that? Because so many people think that they have to have the ability, they have to have the strength, they have to have the time, they have to have the resources. It irks me to all get out when somebody says, uh, you know, uh, do you want to be in full-time ministry, but you don't want to be supported, you don't want to have to worry about your finances? Well, that's never been something for you to worry about to begin with. That's God's responsibility not yours if God calls you he'll equip you if God calls you he'll provide but we keep trying to figure out how we're going to do ministry how we're going to preach how we're going to do uh, uh, whatever it is that God's called us to do and I'm trying to tell you that you don't have to God empowers who he calls anyway I got off on that need to get back so what we're looking at is the word um, what was the word we're looking at there number one possible all right we're looking at the word possible. So I need to get back, back off that rabbit trail and get back to where I'm supposed to be. So uh, the, the first thing under that is we want to see that Jesus was empowered by the Spirit of God. Now, so many people think that, well, Jesus could do that because Jesus was the Son of God. Well, he was the Son of God. He is the Son of God. He forever will be the Son of God. But when he walked on this planet, everything he did, he did not do with his godly powers. He did it as a man empowered by the same Spirit of God that lives inside of us and rests upon you and me. It says in Acts 10, 38, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power and because of that he went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him the spirit of God on Jesus's life and the power of God in this verse are related it, they're correlated through this verse it's by means of the spirit of God that Jesus was able to be empowered to do what he did to release the power of God into the lives of other people to save heal and deliver people from their bondages from their situations from their afflictions from whatever it is that they were dealing with in life in fact in Luke 4 18 and 19 Jesus gets up and when he begins his ministry he says the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me he has empowered me he has graced me that's really what that word anointed means he has graced me he has set me apart and he has empowered me to do what to preach the gospel to the poor he has empowered me to do what to heal the brokenhearted he has empowered me to do what to proclaim liberty to the captives he has empowered me to do what to preach recovery of sight to to to, to give re recovery of sight to the blind he's empowered me to set at liberty those who are oppressed he's empowered me to proclaim 
proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. So what's happening here, Jesus is saying, uh, these are the works that I've been sent to do. This is what God has equipped me to do. And the way that I do this is by means of the Spirit of God upon my life. Matthew 4, 24, because of the Spirit of God that was on his life, we see what he did. His fame went throughout all Syria. They brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. Another text says he healed them all. How did he do that? Because he was empowered by the power of God through means of the Spirit of God that rested upon his life. Not only was Jesus empowered by the Spirit of God, the disciples were empowered by the Spirit of God. As Jesus moved in the power of the Spirit, so too would the disciples be expected to do the same. John 14 and 12, Jesus said, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, there's that word believe, we're going to tackle that here in a minute, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these will he do, because I go to my Father. What works were, was he doing? Acts 10, 38. He went around doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. Other text says he was uh, healing the sick, raising the dead, cleansing the lepers, casting out devils. How did he do that? By means of the Spirit of God. And now he's saying, the works that I do, he's pointing his disciples to his disciples, and he says, greater works than these shall you do. Now, what do you mean greater? Uh, actually, in the context, I think the word greater means numerical quantity, not so much quality, but quantity, uh, that because of the Spirit of God that was now going to be imparted to all of them, greater works, more numerous works would be done because there's not just one man walking around empowered by the Spirit of God. And yes, I know he's the Son of God, but as I told you before, he functioned as a man empowered by the Spirit of God. Now there's not just one man walking around empowered by the Spirit of God, healing the sick, raising the dead, cleansing the lepers, casting out devils. But now you're going to have in the apostles, you're going to have 12, and then you're going to have 72. And what are they doing? The works that Jesus did so 72 plus 12 is 84 so now you have 84 people empowered by the spirit of god and this is just in the pages of the gospels that are going around healing the sick raising the dead cleansing the lepers casting out devils so a numerical quality much greater than just the one now i'm not saying they're greater than jesus don't misunderstand me i'm saying quantity now the potential is for much greater things to happen quantity wise Matthew 10, 7 and 8, I just said that. As you go preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons, freely you've received, freely get. How is this going to happen? How are they going to do these things? How are they going to do greater works? Acts 1 and 8, you shall receive, there's that word, power. You're going to receive power. Is he talking to the disciples, uh, the apostles? Yes. But I'm going to uh, uh, take a leap here and I hope that you'll jump with me without spending a lot of time because I've done this over and over and over again that just like he empowered the disciples with the Spirit of God with power now I want you to notice it doesn't say he empowered them with tongues I'm not against tongues we speak in tongues we practice tongues tongues uh, are the uh, uh, um, uh, they're, they're one of the ways that we pray for the Lord. They're one of the ways that we're able to give a message with interpretation of tongues. But in this particular, uh, another, uh, when you get baptized with the Holy Spirit, tongues are the evidence that you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. That's the way we believe in the assemblies. That's the way I believe. But at the same time, it's not about the tongues. What is it about? We've made it about the tongues, but it's not about the tongues. What is it about? You shall receive power. Who is he talking to? Us. He's talking to the apostles. But we're disciples as well, and so he's talking to us. Power to do what? Power to be witnesses. What were the witnesses supposed to do? They were supposed to preach, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. That's what he meant by being a witness. How were they supposed to witness? By being empowered by the Holy Spirit. Wait a minute, I can't preach, I can't heal, I can't do this. That's exactly right, you can't, you can't do that. But I have good news for you, the power of God is available to come upon you to do what you cannot do. 
Acts 5, 12 through 16. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest there joined them, but the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits. And they were all healed. Now, sometimes when we read the pages of the New Testament, we kind of say, well, that's then, but church today is different. And I want you to know that church today is different. Christianity today is different. But it's not different because it's supposed to be different. It's different because we've fallen short of the standard. It's my contention, this, this book is called The Canon of Scripture. Now, it's not a canon that you shoot, not that kind of canon. The word canon actually means, it's the same word we get the word ruler from, right? Anybody here, anybody here ever work with, uh, with uh, measuring tape, right? You ever cut a board and then you come back and it's too short? You go back and cut it again and it's still too short? <laughs> right? How do you know it's too short? Because the measuring tape tells me it's too short, right? Because the measuring tape is your standard. Well, I'll use it anyway, right? We can make it work. No, no, it's not according to the standard. It's not what we're supposed to do. This is the standard. And what ends up happening, what happens is when we read this, we're not supposed to disassociate ourselves from what took place back then. What we're supposed to see is and this is what's supposed to be like. And if it's not like that, I'm not supposed to lower the bar. I'm supposed to, to make sure, because if I've lowered the bar, then if I've lowered the bar, everything seems okay. Right? Everything's fine. Why? Because according to the standard that I've created, I measure up. I can do that. Right? But when I go back to the standard that the Bible says is the standard, and then I find that that standard is not what's going on in my life, then we have a choice to do a couple of things. One is we can say, I don't want to read that. Or we can say, that's not for today. Or we can say, that's not happening today. And so if it's not happening, I believe the Word of God is true. I don't believe God's changed. Right? like that couple that's driving in the car they've been married for 30 years and the wife turns around and he says I remember when uh, we used to sit close together and everywhere we went we were always close to each other and the man's driving and he turns to her and he said well I haven't moved who moved reminds me of the Revelations 3 chapter 3 where it talks about Jesus behold I stand at the door and knock right now Jesus didn't didn't, didn't leave. What happened is they became distant from him. And he's wanting to get back in a relationship with the church. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So when we look and we see that's not what's happening today, and that's not what's happening in my life, I need to replace that standard. And if I'm falling short, then I need to begin to seek God for why it is that in my life I'm not living up to the standards that you set. If this is supposed to be New Testament Scripture, New Testament Church, if this is the way it's supposed to be, we saw it happen in Jesus, we saw it happen in the New Testament Church, why is it not happening today? Well, is it because church is different or because we've fallen short? It's my contention that we're not, uh, we're not believing God for how things are supposed to be. People should be getting saved, healed, delivered, set free. That should be the norm. Today, if somebody gets saved, uh, you know, once every couple of months, we say, thank you, Jesus, that's awesome, and you should. But there's another part of us that should say, something's not right about that. 3,000 people were added to the church. 5,000 people were added to the church. Everybody that came was getting healed. Something's not right. And it's not about condemnation, it's about God. I'm not, I'm not living this. I need you to help me. I need to believe God. I need to get to a place where all of a sudden what you say is the norm becomes the norm in my life. If we were to talk about morality, <coughs> Chris doesn't like to talk about morality today. 
but it seems that a lot of Christians are trying to figure out what's the least amount I can do and get to heaven. Can I smoke and go to heaven? Can I drink and go to heaven? Can I sleep with my girlfriend and go to heaven? Can I not pay tithes and go to heaven? You know, those are valid questions. The Bible talks about those questions, and we have answers for that in the Bible, and we have answers for that. We're not going to so much get into that. What I want to get into is that idea that what is the least I can do and still go to heaven is not the way Christianity was lived in the first century. Jesus said, He that would come after me must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow after me. That word deny self, I love the commentary translation, and some of you are hearing this for the first time, but some of y'all have heard this before, but it says, deny your right to self-rule. In other words, you don't get to make the standards. You don't get to decide what's right and wrong. Jesus sits on the throne. He decides what's right and wrong. And when I'm saying, what's the least I can do? Can I do this? Can I do that? And that's usually not what we do. I can do this and I still feel good about myself. It's not about whether you feel good about yourself. It's, is it right in the eyes of God? Well, why don't you ask him? Well, I don't want to do that. (laughs) Well, because there's something inside of you that probably already knows it ain't right. Anyway, let's get back. I'm doing a lot of meddling tonight. So... um, Acts 5, 12 through 16, we just read that. Mark 16, 17 through 18, these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Once again, this verse, these verses in Mark relates the, the idea of power in the context of signs and wonders, the works of power that bring God glory, it relates that power with the idea of believing. These po- signs, these works of power will follow those who believe. I don't believe that this is saying these signs will follow those who are called believers, I believe what this text wants to bring out is that these signs will follow those who are believing God for these signs to follow. You can be a believer and not believe that God heals. Because our con- when we say believer, what we're saying, I'm a Christian, right? I'm a Christian, but I don't believe God heals. You can be a believer and not believe that God heals. But what we're talking about is not the designation believer. What we're talking about is someone who actually is pressing in to believe God for these things. These signs will follow those who believe these signs will follow those. I believe when I lay hands on the sick that people are going to get healed. I prayed for lots of people that didn't get healed, but I don't attribute that to God. I just attribute that to the fact that I've got to learn how to hear God better. I've got to learn how to flow with God better. I, I, it's not God, you know, and it's not the people. I'm not going to ever blame somebody that's not having faith unless they particularly say, I just don't, don't want to get healed. Well, that's a totally different thing. So it's not God that's coming short. It's not me that's coming short. But every time I pray for somebody, I believe that they're going to get healed. Why? These signs shall follow those that believe. If I don't believe something, why would I do it? Because God honors faith. That'll bring me to the second point. Second point we want to look at is that word believe. Mark 23, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. The word believes is the Greek word pistis, and it means faith. If we go to the Bible itself to define faith, we find that definition in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 11.1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen in the amplified version it says faith is the assurance or the confirmation or the title deed of things we hope for and the proof of things we do not see and the conviction of their reality faith perceiving as real fact what is not revealed to the senses I like a, um, a translation that basically says faith is the title deed of things hoped for and the convincing evidence of things not seen. That's kind of a real short way of uh, summing up what's here in, in the Amplified Bible. So what do you mean by that? Well, I, used to, I like to say this. I, I have a house in Bolivia, right? Now, I've seen that house, and I've been there, but if I had a house that my dad gave me and I've never been there, but I get a title deed to that house... 
If I have the title deed to that house, I know that house is mine, even if I've never seen it. Even if I've never been there, I know that house is mine. Why? Because I have the title deed. And that's what faith is. Faith is the title deed of things hopeful. When you have faith in your heart, you know something belongs to you. You know that the promises of God are true. You know that what God says is for you as well. Why? Because faith has been birthed in your heart. Another way, it's the convincing evidence of things not seen. Anybody here ever been on a jury? Right? Now, the reason you're on a jury is because something happened that you were not there that it happened. And you're trying to figure out, they're trying to present to you convincing evidence of whether that happened or whether it didn't happen because usually somebody's on trial for it and you've got to determine did it happen or did it not happen. And you have a lawyer on one side, he's trying to prevent, convince, present convincing evidences to you, and you have a lawyer on the other side trying to present convincing evidence to you, and somewhere in the middle of that, you're going to get a picture of what happened, and you're going to become convinced that either it did happen or it didn't happen, but it's going to become convincing to you. You're going to know because of what's been presented to you, even though you were never there. Right? And that's what happens when God's truth, because of who God is, and God presents His truth to you, He presents His word to you, we become convinced that it's true. How, how do I know it's true? It's not because I've seen it. It's because I had an encounter with God. I have an experience with God. I believe God's word to be true. When I believe God's word to be true, I'm convinced that it's true, regardless of anything that tells me it's not. In our text, the tense used for uh, all things are possible for him who believes, pictures a person not who believed in the past, but a person who is presently and continually believing. This is not one who has had an experience of faith in the past, rather it's a person who is presently believing right now. Doesn't, the, the, doesn't it say in, in, in Hebrews 11:1, 1, now, it doesn't say faith is, it says now faith is. Faith is present tense. Well, I gave my heart to the Lord all those years ago. That's fine, but what are you doing now? Right? I went, to, I went up to the altar, and I, and I signed a piece of paper, or I made a confession of faith. Well, that's great, but are you believing now? Faith is present. If you have faith, it's present tense. It affects who you are now because you believe God in the present. Uh, whatever it is that God has spoken to, you're believing for that in the present. So his faith, this is not one who's an experience of faith, rather it's a person who's presently believing right now. His faith is actively reaching forward right now to grab a hold of what God has promised. His faith is habitually, constantly, consistently, and unwaveringly straining forward to take hold of that desired goal he sees before him that God presents in his word. Um, I'm, I'm reminded of, of uh, the idea of, of faith being present tense, is that, is that you believe God for whatever it is he is telling you, whatever it is that he is making real to you, whatever promise is in your life, it becomes a reality to you, and no matter what comes against you, because oftentimes what happens is when you get a promise from God, then all of a sudden it seems like the very opposite happens. Everything is totally different. Everything is totally opposite to what God said in your heart. But faith is convinced that what God says is true, and you persevere through the obstacles, you persevere through the, 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 uh, the impediments and the afflictions that the enemy purposely throws in your path, to keep you from experiencing what God wants in your life, but you have such a, a hold of what God has promised, you have such a hold of what God has spoken to your life, that no matter what takes place, you're not going to let go. Mark eleven twenty two 22 through 24, Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Now we might not realize that in this verse, because we often, what we think, well I spoke to the mountain and it didn't happen. You see in our text, let me pause here for a minute, in our text, uh, when Jesus was up on the mountain, the father came to the disciples because Jesus wasn't there, and he says, i got a problem with my boy. Can you help him? Can you cast the demon out? And the disciples had had success, success 
success after success casting out demons. But this particular one, for some reason, they couldn't do it. And so when Jesus came on the mountain, he said, we can't cast it out. And then Jesus said, oh, you unbelieving and perverse generation. What had happened is somewhere along the, along the lines, they began to believe that they couldn't when Jesus had told them in the word that they could. Faith perseveres through the obstacles. Faith doesn't take no for an answer. Just because this demon was saying no, how many of you know that Goliath kept saying to the Israelites, we're going to beat you, we're, you're not going to get your inheritance, we're going to take all over you. But there was one guy by the name of David that said, that's not true, that's not what God promised, that's not what God says. You come to me with swords and, and spears, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. And David was willing to fight to see the promise of God become evident and real in his life and the life of Israel. And faith is not like, I believe God and I'm just going to see things happen in my life. No, I believe God and I'm going to continue to believe God until I see things happen in my life. I'm going to persevere. And that's what this verse is talking about, have faith in God. Here Jesus commands us to have faith in God. But actually, another way of translating that is to have God-like faith. What does that mean? What does that look like? You see, in the, in the disciples' case, the, 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 the disciples got to a place that we can't, we can't do it. And another way of translating that, he said, why couldn't we do that? And another text says, why couldn't we do that? He said, because of your little faith. Uh, actually, another way of translating that is, instead of saying because of your little faith, it's because of your brief faith. You quit too soon. In this particular instance, what does it look like to have God-like faith? Jesus goes on to describe what it looks like. He shows us God-like faith in action. He says to the disciples that whoever speaks to the, to the mountain and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. So what we often picture is there's a mountain in my life. I get in front of the mountain. I speak to the mountain. I just hold that in my heart. And as long as I don't doubt, as long as I don't say anything, I spoke to the mountain, it's going to be done. It's going to be taken care of. That's possible. But in the Greek, the word says, what if you, you know, but believes that what he says will come to pass. The context of that is that believe what he says and continues to say will come to pass. He will have whatever it is that he says. So you speak to the mountain and it doesn't move. You pray for an affliction, and it doesn't move. You're believing God for a breakthrough in your finances, and it doesn't move. So what does faith do? Well, in the disciples' case, he said, oh, you have little faith. They quit. But what is God teaching us? God is teaching us, hey, I know what the Word of God says. He said, you're going to move. And so you didn't move the first time. I'm telling you, you're going to move. Have you ever had any kids that were stubborn in your life? Don't raise your hand. I'm not looking at your eyes. I don't want to hear that. And you tell them, go clean your room. This is an example. Go clean your room, and they don't move. Do you say to yourself, oh, well, I sure wanted their room clean. I guess their room, I just can't, I can't do it. I guess I'm not going to do it. Is that what you do? Or you say, I said go clean your room. I've got a dog. I've got a dog out there. I'm not correlating kids and dogs, but I'm saying I, I don't have, my kids are all grown up, so I have a dog, and his name is Keely, and I'll let him out. And Keely is a, a little, he's a schnauzer, and one of the characteristics of schnauzers is they're stubborn, right? So I'll, I, I say, Keely, come in the house. And he sits down, and he looks at me. And then sometimes he doesn't want to look at me, so he's just looking around. I said, Keely, get in the house. He's just pretending like, and also I've learned that if I growl, He'll come. Okay, so he starts coming, right? Because I saw that's what, the, that's what the other dog does. When he wants him to do something, he growls and he responds. Well, today, I said, get in the house. Nothing. I growl. Get in the house. Nothing. So do you think I said, well, I guess he's not coming to the house? No. You know what I did? I got out of the house, and I walked to where he was, and I made him move. I made him get in the house. Why? Because I know what he needs to do, and he's, he's stubborn, but he's not the one in charge. 
He doesn't have the understanding that I'm the one that's in charge. I have that understanding. So in this scripture, what I need you to understand is that if you speak to the mountain, you speak to the affliction, you speak to the situation, you, you have the promise of God in your life. You know what God is telling you and the thing doesn't move. Faith doesn't quit. Faith speaks again and again and again and again. Well, how long do I pray? How long do I speak? How? Until it moves. Until it moves. Do you hear what I'm saying? Well, I didn't know that's what it meant to have faith. I didn't know that's what it meant to believe. That's why I'm teaching you tonight. I want you to understand all things are possible to one who believes and continues to believe. Doesn't quit. As we said previously, this tense pictures a person who is believing. This is not someone who has had an experience of faith in the past. Rather, it is a person who is presently believing in the present. His faith, her faith, is actively reaching forward right now to grab hold of what God has promised. Their faith is habitually, consistently, constantly, and unwaveringly straining forward to take hold of that desired goal that he sees before him. Now, I, I felt like the Lord really laid this in my own particular life, laid it bare because I'm believing God that one day I'm not going to have a problem with my back anymore. I have struggled with my back. But I, I know the promises of God. I've been standing on the promises of God. I believe the promises of God. But sometimes my back talks back. I go, no. I tell it, this is what the promise of God is. He forgives all my iniquities. He heals all my diseases, right? Uh, to the one who fears my name, the Son of Righteous will arise with healing in his wings. I will go forth like a calf, leaping from its stalls. Jesus, uh, filled with the Holy Spirit and power, he went around doing good, healing all who were sick of the, uh, afflicted of, of the devil, who were, uh, uh, who were <laughs> sick of the devil, because God was with him. Uh, I tried to say three things at once. But anyway, that's the promises of God. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover well why is it that i'm not totally healed yet i'm getting better but why is it i'm not totally healed yet? i don't know all i know is this is the promise one time i asked the lord because i struggle sometimes do y'all ever struggle i struggle i know it may come across like i don't have any struggles but I try to be open about my struggles i struggle and i said well god i'd read this other people to get get healings right away other people get healings pretty quickly i've been believing god for years and years and i'm still believing god and god i'm not saying i don't believe you but what am i doing something wrong am i without faith and the lord gave me a picture one time and he said rick i want you to think of it this way you're digging a well you're digging a well and you just keep on digging he said, because when that well hits, not only are you going to drink from that well, but many, many others are going to get to drink from that well that you're digging right now. You know what that helped me to do? To keep persevering, to keep digging, to keep believing, to keep uh, uh, declaring, to keep uh, confessing that God's word is true. And I will see the goodness of, I am seeing the goodness of God, but I will see the goodness of God. Not when I get to heaven. Yes, I'll see it there. Not only then, but in the land of the living. You hear what I'm saying? So, the picture that I have in mind, and I'm going to end with this, is the one of Moses lifting up his staff on the mountain as Joshua fought the Amalekites in the valley. Uh, the way, uh, let me read the passage first. Exodus 17, 11 through 13. And so it was when Moses held up his hand that the Israel prevailed, and when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side, the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. So Moses didn't get up on the mountain and just lift his staff once and put it down. Right? Sometimes we think, well, if I have faith, I'll speak to this thing, and then I just ignore it, forget about it, and it's going to be okay. Sometimes it happens that way. But most of the time, what I found in my life, I got to keep my hands up. But guess what happens sometimes? You get tired. You go through periods of doubt. You go through periods of unbelief. And you're tempted to let your hands back down. But what you'll find if you're able to see in the spiritual realm is that as you keep your hands lifted up, as you keep speaking to the mountain, as you keep confessing the promises of God, as you keep declaring the goodness of God over your life, as you keep, uh, you know, uh, uh, believing God for what he said is going to happen in your life, it's like keeping your hands up. 
He said, well, I'm having a hard time keeping my hands up. Well, then you need to get two or three people uh, that will gather together in his name to hold your hands up, to believe God with you. Hear what I'm saying? So uh, it's a picture of present tense faith. Keeping your hands up. Jesus told the man that came to him, getting back to our text, that all things are possible to the one who believes and continues to believe. That word is the same word translated faith. Once again, the context is one who continues to exhibit faith in God. One last scripture before I finish. Um, I didn't put this in there, but, but it, it, it fits. In James 4 and 7, it says, Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee. Right? God, I'm so sorry. I messed up. Satan, leave. I'm done. Is that what it means? No. I hope it happens that way. But really, we need to understand the context here. Submit yourself to God. Continually coming under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Placing yourself under the shadow of of his wings. God is the one that has the power over the enemy. God lives inside of us. It's, I, I don't have the power in myself. It's Christ in me. It's in his name and his authority. So I have to learn how to submit myself to God. I have to learn how to stay under the cloud in the desert by day and the fire by night. I have to, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High, I have to learn how to, uh, to dwell under the secret place of the Most High. Submit myself to God. And that's a lifelong process. Right? When God moves, I need to learn how to move. When God says stay, I need to learn how to stay. When God says stay and I want to move, everything within me wants me to move. But if God says stay, I need to stay. I need to learn how to submit myself to God. And then resist the devil. And some of y'all that are new, I, my, my favorite way of describing this is that we often think that when we're in a fight with the enemy, it's a one-punch fight. I resist the devil. But guess what? He resists back. So what do you do? You resist the devil, and he resists back. So how long do you resist the devil? Until he flees. You resist. We think we're in a one-punch fight, but it, what ends up happening is we're in a 15-round brawl. Well, how, is, how, how am I going to be victorious when I'm in a 15-round brawl? You just have to keep standing on the Word of God. You need to keep submitting yourself to God and resisting the devil. And if you will do that, God is saying the end result, he's going to flee. The end result, that kid's going to be free. Why? Because I told you he was going to be free. When I said we're going to the other side of the lake, uh, uh, and the wind says you're not going, and the rain says you're not going, and fear says you're not going. When I said we're going on the other side, you got to continue to believe no matter what says you're not going to, and not begin to embrace uh, the, the voice of the enemy, the report of that unbelief that's around you. You say, God said I'm going, I'm going. I don't care what it takes. I don't care how it's going to happen. If I have to swim to get on the other side, I'm getting there because God said we're going to the other side. That's faith. Believing God, trusting in God. And listen, I'm not saying that you have to be perfect. I'm not saying that you're not going to waver. I'm not saying that all these things are going to happen. The Bible says that Abraham wavered not through unbelief. What does that mean? That means he was walking through the promised land. God said, walk through the promised land. Keep walking through the promised land. And to me, it's like he gave me a picture of this. And he was walking through a territory in the promised land filled with unbelievites. And what do unbelievites speak? Unbelief. What was Abraham wrestling with? Unbelief. What did he keep hearing? Unbelief. What did he keep feeling? Unbelief. But how did he waver not? Not by not feeling, not by not hearing. He wavered not by continuing to walk out the promise of God. And when we're seeing all these things come against us, everything that says it's not going to happen, it's, it's, it's not for you, it's, it's, uh, it's never going to take place in your life, you're never going to be free, you're never going to be whole, all these things are taking place, you just keep on walking out the promise that said, God promised me, and if God is, you know, is uh, faithful, God is faithful to his word, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. If God be for me, who can stand against me? Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. No weapon formed against me shall prosper, no tongue that is raised shall stand hallelujah God promised me and I'm going to believe God and if I believe God and stand with God I know that I'm going to see the promises of God take place in my life alright 
I just want to encourage you today. If one can simply believe, anything is possible. I hope I gave you a little bit of clarity on what it means possible. The power of God is available to take care of any situation that you're facing in life. There's nothing that God cannot and will not do. What's the qualification? You believe. Believe and continue to believe. Continue to stand. For anything is possible, even setting someone possessed uh, from demon spirits free. Wherever faith is present, the impossible is possible.